So right, there's a very famous scene in the Matrix where Neo is offered the red pill <laughs> and the blue pill. And I, was, I really wanted to make some joke, like a really famous scene in Two Girls, One Cup or something. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we're sticking with the Matrix here. Red pill and the blue pill. Um, the red pill, uh, well, the blue pill rather, uh, lets you stay in the Matrix, stay in comfortable ignorance and you, you sort of carry on with life as you think it is. Uh, and the red pill allows you to know the truth. Um, my question to you before we introduce the show is, which one would you have taken in that situation? Thank you, Morpheus. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I feel like... God, this is just the question of my life. Would I rather be ignorant and contented or not? Is this is this the sort of pig in mud or, or yes. Aristotle Good. unhappy? I feel like the it's funny. I feel like the smarter answer is the pig in mud, but I feel like I'd just be compelled to to go with Aristotle. Once you know it exists, can Once you, you know can it. you unknow it? Well, I mean, literally you can. That's what the blue pill does. That's true. <laughs> That's exactly the point. <laughs> <laughs> hey guys, welcome to the Morality Everyday Things. I'm Anthony. <laughs> I'm Jacob. And we'll be talking about the overlap between uh, the Matrix, uh, the brain in the vat, solipsism, and whether we're living in a simulation. This felt like a really fitting episode to do because in the first episode of this season, as you may recall, uh, we were talking about everything everywhere all at once and absurdism and how it was a great film and a really nice example of mm -hmm. art that makes a deeper philosophical uh, idea or point come to life mm -hmm. and then we said in that episode we're like yeah it's like it's like the matrix and solipsism and we're like, like, well we should do an episode on that and so we have yeah. saved this episode to uh, uh i think wrap up the season with yes um, well let's if this goes last as well actually it will also relate to our previous episode where we talk a bit about reality the extent mm -hmm. to which you know we, we start to talk like well is the reality that we are, are imparted from say for example media is that even real mm -hmm. um you know there's a, a little bit of a at least a questioning reality theme there there is there is indeed yes. um so i will very quickly uh define solipsism for you guys but what we'll do uh for the structure of this episode is we're going to look at the matrix pull out those philosophical ideas that it uh makes clear we'll talk about the brain in the vat we'll talk about descartes and um kind of tie this all together with this question of, you know, what is the true nature of our reality? Jacob, you you speak a little bit of French, right? Um, but uh, Descartes, don't say the S, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> what did I say? Descartes? Or... <laughs> you said Descartes. <laughs> Descartes, oh right. Descartes. <laughs> Descartes. So should we start with what is solipsism? Can well, you say that without the S, please? All, 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 <laughs> all, <laughs> yeah. Tell uh, us what solipsism. We'll start with solipsism, and then we'll we will link how that is connected to bringing about the matrix. So mm -hmm. uh, later on in the episode. So solipsism, from the Latin solus alone and ipse self, is the philosophical idea that only one's mind is sure to exist. Uh, it's important to clarify. We're not saying that in a in a literal sense. Um, we're saying that in an epistemological sense it's an epistemological mm -hmm. position it holds that knowledge of anyone's outside anything outside one's own mind is is to some extent unsure mm -hmm. right uh, the external world and other minds cannot be known and might not exist outside the mind can we think of some sort of example that might help us understand that position jake great question and well in the film the matrix oh Solipsism is explored through the concept that the world experienced by humans is a simulated reality known as the matrix. And this is, this is a really popular idea, idea in science fiction, Rick and Morty explore mm -hmm. it among other things. Uh, but in the matrix specifically, the main character, uh, Neo discovers that the reality he thought was real is actually an artificial construct created by machines to keep humanity unaware of their subjugation. And obviously this idea aligns with solipsism by challenging the distinction between what is real and what is illusory. The matrix and, and, the sort of blue pill, red pill question that we introduced the episode with. Uh, the Matrix presents this idea, really, that our perception of reality could be deceptive. So we could actually just be existing in this comfortable matrixy world, which is actually all made up of code, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. we're just kind of happy. But in fact, we're sort of in this pod somewhere and our energy is being harvested. And yes. Yeah. And, and, and it's impossible to know whether what's generally real, genuinely real, mm. and what is actually just being constructed either by our minds or kind of imposed on our minds by, by some sort of environment that we're in exactly now th there's one important distinction though between the matrix uh and as we'll as we'll explain the brain in the vat and solipsism mm -hmm. solipsism holds that the only thing that i can be sure of is my own mind right mm -hmm. however in the matrix other people still continue to exist in different layers of the reality right mm -hmm. so if you are a person in the matrix and you're not one of the smith mm -hmm. or whatever those real, agent smith yep. agent smiths if you're not one of them then you are definitely a person in a pod in the other reality mm -hmm. but in solipsism we're saying that the entire thing could be constructed. People could not be real, mm -hmm. right? The mm -hmm. only one I know is real is me. 
Um, and you know, if you've seen a lot of the Matrix, then you you may actually uh, you you could see how that may follow. Uh, it's not necessarily implied because if people exist in the two mm -hmm. realities, you see maybe they exist in the three. But um, the point there is is also that not only is there just oh maybe this reality isn't real and we're in some other and this is a simulation, but that at the end of the Matrix, obviously you realize. It, sorry, spoil. I can do a spoiler for decades. Ago. <laughs> he has powers in the quote unquote real world as well, which makes us realize maybe this isn't real either. <laughs> mm, it's a kind of nested simulation potentially, uh, yeah. which is also a little bit like uh, Inception with its dreams and yeah. layers and layers of that. Some level along the way, you're just a brain in a vat. So Jake, the inspiration for the brain in the vat, do you want to tell us a little bit about this? Yeah, well, actually the point there was the, the brain in the vat is the thought experiment that provides the inspiration for the matrix. Um, mm -hmm. And there've been many variations on this theme, but they all have at their root an epistemological question which, uh, you know, it, it, a question of knowledge and how we know things. Oh, yes, we actually didn't say that earlier. Epistemological means relating to knowing. Yes. Uh, they all have at their root these, this question about the nature of our reality of thought, consciousness, and meaning. What, what, what is the true state of those things? Um, so the Brain in the Vat is a modernized version of Rene Descartes' evil demon thought experiment. It's originated by a guy called Gilbert Harmon. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about Descartes, obviously, uh, very soon in this episode. Descartes, you said it with the S again. Oh, <laughs> <man>. <laughs> it's a habit now. Um, found in many science fiction stories. Uh, sorry, this is the brain in the vat. So, found in many science fiction stories, the brain in the vat outlines a scenario in which a, ma a mad, si a mad? A mad, mad scientist... A mad scientist called Descartes. <laughs> yeah, a mad scientist, a machine, or some other entity might remove a person's brain from the body, suspend it in a vat of life-sustaining liquid, and connect its neurons by wires to a supercomputer that would provide it with electrical impulses identical to those a brain normally receives. And according to such stories, the computer would then be simulating reality, including appropriate responses to the brain's own output. Mm. And the disembodied brain would continue to have perfectly normal conscious experiences like a person of an embodied brain would mm. without those actually being related to objects or events in the real world. And you can see there the clear inspiration for the matrix. But the point to sort of draw away from all this is from the perspective of the brain, it's impossible to know whether you're being deceived or not. Are you actually walking down the street or are you stewing in a vat imagining you're walking down the street? That's the, the, the sort of key thing there. Yes. Uh, I suppose a follow-on question that we'll, we'll come to is, why does it matter? Mm. Um, so it's an argument for philosophical skepticism as well as solipsism. Yeah. And I suppose just to expand on skepticism, it's basically, the point there is the conclusion of all this isn't necessarily that you are the only thing that exists. The conclusion is it's an argument to be skeptical about the nature of your reality. Yes. Not necessarily that yeah. by it's, default, I'm, I'm all that exists. Exactly. It's, I am the only thing I can prove to or know to exist, that it, which is not synonymous with nothing else exists, right? I just can't know that they exist the same way that I know that I can. Um, Jacob, carry on. Let's take a trip back in time to, I actually can't remember when Descartes existed. Ah, 1641. Let's take a trip back to France, 1641. Oh, uh, bonjour. <laughs> actually, interesting fact for you. Mm -hmm. Um Prior to the French, in fact, prior to the, even in World War One, I, I think only 70% of people spoke the same French. Mm -hmm. Prior to the French Revolution, which I think 1641 was. Uh, so wait, the, Napoleon's time was like 1790s or something, right? Yes, yeah, so the revolution must have been sometime in the 1600s. Wait, what's the revolution? You're not talking about the one where they chopped off the king's head? Yeah. That was like 17, 18 Okay, something. so the pre-French Revolution. Only about 10% of French people spoke French as we understand it. People in Paris and what people... Sacré bleu. Sacré bleu. Because there was many regional, regional dialects, right? Yeah. Uh, they would be either dialects of French or, for example, Basque. Mm -hmm. Dialects like that. It was only standardized after the, uh, I think, by Napoleon? That would make sense. Because I mean... Or, or actually, even after Napoleon. It happened in a similar time in the UK with Samuel Johnson's dictionary, right? And, and there were... People spell things weirdly and mm -hmm. they still speak strangely in different parts of the country. <laughs> um, but yes, sorry, carry on. So the brain of that is a contemporary version, as we said, um, of, a, of a similar sort of strand of argument. Uh, and, and you actually see it pop up in different cultures in history. You've got uh, the Hindu Maya illusion. You've got Plato's allegory of the cave. Yep. Uh, you've got Zhuangzi's Zhuangzi dreamed he was a butterfly. Uh, I don't know much about that. Mm -hmm. But the famous one we're going to talk about is the evil demon in Rene Descartes' meditations on first philosophy. Mm -hmm. Uh, tell us about the evil demon. Then. In the first of his 1641 meditations on first philosophy, uh, he imagines a malevolent god or an evil demon of utmost power and cunning has employed all his energies in order to deceive me. This malevolent god or evil demon is imagined to present a complete illusion of an external world so that Descartes can say, I shall think that the sky, the air, the earth, colors, shapes, sounds, and all external things, including the S at the same end of my name, are, <laughs> <laughs> are merely the delusions of dreams which he has devised to ensnare my judgment. 
I shall consider myself as not having hands or eyes or flesh or blood or senses, but as falsely believing that I have all these things. It is one of the several methods of systemic, systematic doubt that Descartes employs in meditations. Uh, so roughly, what is the point of the book that he's, the, the, this leads to this uh, excerpt? Here? He's basically trying to find something he can be certain of. So he's yeah. saying... It know, is an epistemological uh, exploration. Yeah. If, you, if, you're, if you're trying to build a foundation of knowledge, what is it that you can be absolutely yep. rock solid, dead the certain, axiomatic short axiomatic things. Yeah. What can you start with? And he's saying, okay, the best way to find those things is to doubt everything. And he does it in a very systematic way. Like this. Like this. And then he's like, okay, a lot of these things kind of fall away. A lot of things crumble. However. However. One thing remains. One thing remains. You cannot doubt that you are doubting. Wait, are you gaming? On a Chromebook? Yep. It's got a high-res 120 hertz display, plus this killer RGB keyboard. And I can access thousands of games anytime, anywhere. Stop playing. What? Get out of here. Huh? Yeah. I want you to stop playing and get out of here so I can game on that Chromebook. Got it. Go ahead, break it down real Discover the ultimate cloud gaming machine, a new kind of Chromebook. The act of doubting everything is the one thing you can be sure of, and this for him forms the first building block of philosophy. There's a nice quote a little bit further below where he says, um, his objective was to find a starting point from which to reason, to find an irreversible certainty. And where did he find this? In his own consciousness. Doubt as I may. Uh, no, I won't bother French. <laughs> mm. Doubt as I may. I cannot doubt of my own existence because my very doubts reveal to me a something which doubts. You may call this an assumption if you will. I point out the fact as one above and beyond all logic, which logic can neither prove nor disprove, but which must always remain an irreversible certainty and as such a fitting basis of philosophy. And this leads to the very famous expression you've no doubt heard, which goes, I think therefore I am, or in Latin, cogito ergo sum. Oh, you know what? I didn't even realize you were right that the more full expression is dubito ergo sum, vel yeah. quadidum est cogito ergo sum, mm -hmm. which I doubt, therefore I am, blah, 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 blah. I think. Therefore, I am. Mm -hmm. um, and that will be the expression that people are most familiar with, which is associated with uh, solipsism. I think it's interesting. A lot of people will often hear that and think it's something about as some sort of romantic statement about, oh, you know, the human experience and how beautiful thinking is. When actually it's very, very literal. It's, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, I am thinking and therefore there must be a thing that is doing the thinking that I am thinking. <laughs> and it's interesting because that has like you can't take away from the impact that that had. I mean, Bertrand Russell described uh, Descartes as literally one of the founding fathers of Western philosophy and, and, and his meditations to some extent, uh, you know, you look at the history of sort of Western philosophical thought and go back On to some sort of Greeks. Cartesian graph. <laughs> <laughs> you go from the ancient Greeks and then there's the dark ages and then it philosophy almost kind of begins again with Descartes and this, and this building block and, and mm. yeah, it's massively impactful. Now Jake, um, uh, could you very quickly tell us, uh, first of all, uh, a, a critique of that dictum but then mm. can you tell us where he takes that in the book <laughs> yeah this is funny so one critique and and this is i suppose if, if you're if you're going to try and apply the same logic he did where it's like doubt everything that you can you could say that he makes a little bit of a leap by presupposing that there is an i which must be doing the thinking so he says i think therefore i am and according to this guy pierre gassendi he says the most Descartes is actually entitled to say was that thinking is occurring. He, he's kind of assuming there is an I that is doing the thinking. And this is, that, I think, a bit of a linguistic thing, to be yeah, honest. Yeah, is that not just the semantics of what counts as I? Because if thinking is occurring, what is, what is thinking without a thing to do the thinking, whether that's real or conceptual or whatever, or, or thinking is mm. just a string of thoughts? Uh, like, it's just, a, it, it, I think it's the semantics of what counts as I. It, it definitely is. And, and, and part of that is actually interestingly a translation issue because in english you've got three different versions of present active verbs so you've got i think i do think and i am thinking mm -hmm. whereas in latin you just have cogito and thinking. and, and in, in french as well as je pense which is like no that's i think well it could be i am thinking though right and it could be i do think like they're, they're all different very like this present continuous and um mm. and i'm not sure that matters all that much but it, it does sort of say you're right like this guy is like thinking is occurring and necessarily because of the way we use language, uh, it, the way he's expressed it, there is an I that thinks. And, and, and you could say, well, maybe the I doesn't matter. The I is, the I could be X thinks, therefore X is. 
Um, mm. But something about the way that he I think it also experiences implies, this. I, I yeah. think it implies something about the conscious experience, though. Like this is it's, it. Yeah, it's yeah, that yeah. the thinking is some tied together thing that I call I. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and but but yeah, I, I understand that criticism. I think you know it's pedantic. Like we we there's still something profound there, right? Like yeah. there is something that is thinking, uh, and that is a thing. <laughs> yes. So at least we know that that exists. Yeah. If you really want to be pedantic, then you you do end up kind of with these definitions of well, it's existence. Um, and does thinking necessarily presuppose existence or, or have I phrased that correctly? Uh, does existence necessarily follow from thinking? Mm -hmm. is, is this all a, a bit of an ontological game? Mm -hmm. um, I think that's Kierkegaard's attack on this is that it's, it basically kind of defines itself. Yeah. Um, but I think that's all, as you said, I think that's all being uh, overly pedantic because it, there's something certainly quite like profound about being, I'm, I've doubted everything, but I can't doubt that I'm doubting and therefore mm -hmm. I think therefore I am. And that's, yeah. it's, a, it's a great little phrase. Actually. Congrats to him. Congrats <laughs> to him. Hats off, Descartes. Yeah. So we've kind of basically given some context there where solipsism is the idea that only one's mind is certain to exist. Um, and we can see it as a, an extreme form of subjective re idealism. So what is subjective idealism? This goes a little bit deeper and it, it, it kind of says, well, actually, before we do this, sorry, if, if I loop back to Descartes, mm -hmm. um, so where we left off with him was, I think therefore I am, uh, and, and that's the only thing you can be sure of. And that's, while that's, while that's something, it, it does, it, what it implies is, uh, it leaves you with a lot of sort of empty space, right? Like, what actually is the nature of existence if, if all you're sure of is that you exist? And, and Descartes then wanted to, as we say, he wanted to build a whole philosophy around this. So he was like, this is my starting block and how do I then map backwards from that to the rest of the world? Um, and I feel like his, his answer is, is a little bit of a cheat because he basically says, well, God, God wouldn't, wouldn't lie to me. Yeah, God wouldn't actually create a world like this. So he, he kind of says, God saves the day. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually, therefore, we can have faith because I think therefore I am. And, and, and God creates this sort of faith that reality actually exists as you perceive it. Um, so that seems, seems a little bit lame. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. But he had some, come on, he had one insight. He wasn't going to solve all of reality for us. Yeah. Um, I, I actually ran out of time to sort of look at further sort of rebuttals or how, how people have built sort of on this foundation to, to mm, kind of mm. build a better empirical model of how, how the world works. I, I don't know if you know any off the top of your head. I kind of, I only got that far in the notes. Um, no, it's, I mean, it's, it, well, the, part of the problem with this sort of realm of metaphysics is like you're on supposition. How could you even put anything forward? Yeah. yeah. Um, Except for this one brilliant idea. And even that is like, well, what's I? <laughs> but this, this does now link us to the subjective idealism point, um, yep. which, which you were just saying, because subjective idealism is kind of, it sort of takes Descartes literally, uh, and it's this position that says reality and existence are ultimately dependent on the mind or consciousness. You can mm -hmm. only be certain that the mind exists. And then the kind of leap that they make is that the mind creates reality. It's yeah. not that reality exists independently of you and, and you perceive it. Um, existence as we define it is an interaction with consciousness. Yes. So in a sense, if no one is there to perceive that the universe was uh, existing pre-humans, it didn't really exist, right? Yeah. It's not that, I mean, physical space doesn't exist without humans to, to, to perceive it, right? Mm -hmm. It's like how you can't take a photo without having a, a perspective from which to take it, right? It's mm -hmm. just not possible. That's not taking a photo without it. And it, it seems kind of massive to me to say the external world is seen as a product of our mental activity and its existence is contingent upon our perception of it. But that is mm -hmm. what subjective idealists say. There's a guy called George Barclay. He's mm -hmm. like the influential proponent of it. Um, I don't know. It's kind of mad. It, 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 like, it really does make you reflect on existence as a concept, right? Because the, the, the one I really like to think of is, as, as I briefly touched on there, what is existence when humans don't exist, mm. right? Uh, the tree falls in a wood again. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And I mean, even when you see a tree and it's like, why does that tree exist? You still think about that in the context of the tree surrounded by other things. But what if it's like all physical things? What, what does physical even mean? Mm. If not for the context of the body that my brain ride, rides around and can t interact with it. Like mm -hmm. what does physical actually mean? And, and there is also some, I, I really like this idea, again, subjective idealism. I, I like this idea of reality as, um, reality as we perceive it, reality mm -hmm. as we can communicate with each other, um, as something of a product of, of us interacting with it, whereby it's something like the display on a monitor um, where, you know, our brain is the... Our conscious experience is like the software, our brain is like the hardware, and we're interacting with some physical reality. But like, if you think about a computer, it's just all mm. circuitry and ones and zeros, right? Mm -hmm. But it makes something coherent on the screen. 
and we can see issues with that likewise we can see that we get um visual what's it called right no no what, what? um optical illusions right? right 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 and we can see that actually like there is this kind of like there is a clear uh divorce between reality and how we perceive it and existence only is reflected in how we actually can perceive it mm. yeah it's profound very profound indeed um but anyway <laughs> tying tying this back to the matrix um well tying tying this sort of forwards even is um it, the big question that kind of comes out for me is what are the moral implications of solipsism uh and and probably the easiest way to answer that is are there any does it matter like mm. it's a very interesting thought experiment but it almost feels a little bit like for me and this this may be an unfair analogy but it feels a little bit for me like the sort of questions around determinism and free will mm -hmm. in that if you 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 kind of determinism similarly sort of you you hit this point where it's like it's, it's difficult to argue against logically mm. but to live that way practically kind of removes your agency mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. as a as a sort of moral actor and therefore if well, the consequences morality doesn't exist that that feels like a very undesirable place to end up in i i would debate that like what you're describing there is one of those ones where it's like well yes philosophy versus reality right mm -hmm. i would argue that this one you don't even need to make that distinction it's um you know okay let's say the world doesn't exist Let's right. say we are in the matrix. In the matrix, simulation. right. And let, uh, in fact, beyond the matrix, like it's not just that the world, it's not just that this reality that we both are in doesn't exist. I don't even know if you exist, mm -hmm. right? You're nothing to me. <laughs> um, but similar to something like nihilism uh, and absurdism, as we touched on before, uh, maybe that doesn't mean that I can't invest it with, ever, with whatever meaning I want. Mm -hmm. um, but, and, and also practically, like, okay, look, you know, what is my, what is my objective in, in this reality where... Uh, I don't even know what my meaning is. Like, well, roughly to be happy and I, I pursue things that I think give me meaning. It's like, even if the world isn't real, why is that a reason not to pursue that, right? Mm -hmm. I still I still enjoy those feelings in and of themselves. Uh, I still enjoy having meaning and, and pursuing meaning. And so things not being real doesn't, it, it, in the same way that nihilism doesn't seem to undermine that, things, you know, things not being real really has an overlap with nihilism in that sense, right? Mm. Like I still want happiness and largely why I do moral things is because I think they're the right thing to do and it makes me happy to pursue it, not because I feel some obligation necessarily. And even the obligation uh, or duty, you fulfill your duty because you, at some level, mm. feel good for doing that. I think I'm inclined to agree with you uh, because it, it, it's one of those things where it almost becomes, again, a linguistic question of <laughs> what do we mean when we talk about reality? Because at the time in which you're living in the simulation, if you are, it feels real. Mm -hmm. You take the blue pill, the matrix feels real, you carry on with your life. And although there's maybe a sort of theoretical sense that you lose some quality by, by living in a subjective, like by living in a simulated existence when in quote unquote reality, your brain is in a vat somewhere. And obviously this brain in a vat existence is lower quality than mm -hmm. a real lived and breathed, mm -hmm. or, you know, happiness and suffering life. Maybe, maybe not only does it not matter just because it's a thought experiment, maybe it doesn't matter at all because you're still experiencing things. Yeah. And, and, and actually what you obviously do want to take away from this is you, you don't want to run away with the conclusion. If I can only be sure that I exist, then no one else matters in the same yes. way that if there's no meaning in life, then nothing yeah. matters anyway. And, and also, again, distinction between what I can be 100% on knowing versus what, what may be true, but I can't know. Mm. Um, it, it, like you said, it doesn't mean that everyone else doesn't exist. Just because you don't know that everyone exists, you shouldn't behave. Oh, as okay. Yes, don't, or you wouldn't want to behave. That would be yes. undesirable. Not to mention, there's another argument that you can make uh, around expected values, right? Mm -hmm. um, so you can, you can think like, okay, the chance, whilst the chance is large that it's not uh, a simulation, uh, it, it, no, that it's not real. Is the chance larger than? Uh, people debate on that. Whatever. Well, <laughs> well, there's a non-zero chance that it's not real. There's also a non-zero chance that it is real. Mm -hmm. And if objective morality only matters in real circumstances, then there's a chance that you're wrong, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, hey, maybe it's a reason for you to be a little more chill, but don't kill people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so almost like Pascal's wager there, isn't it? It's exactly, like, exactly. You know, that's I, what I was relating. It you to. may as well behave as if it is, and. Um, to all practical purposes, uh, the thought experiment doesn't really matter because, yeah, you're you're certainly better off. Yep. Not losing too much time or sleep yes. questioning the very nature of your existence. Then. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And and when it comes to the matrix, right? Even if say you live in the matrix, even if you have some doubts and you think that you're in the ma in the matrix, if you, as far as you're concerned, are certain that you're going to have to live there until the end of time, mm -hmm. then 
it doesn't matter whether it's real or not. You're going to live with the consequences of your actions. And like I said, you still feel pleasure and pain, mm. Uh, mm. including fulfilling moral obligations to other people, uh, but also the negative consequences of actions that are practical. <laughs> exactly. I think that's quite a good place to to wrap this up. Uh, yeah. Any any further closing thoughts? No, uh, I mean, it's a, a difficult one. Uh, hard for 5 or 6 p.m. Uh, Jake had a coffee. I didn't. But I will <laughs> say, guys, that's a that's a wrap for this season. Um, thank you so much. We really enjoyed so much of it. We enjoyed having guests for the first time. Uh, hopefully, we've enjoyed some the first time having some video stuff. Hey. Um, we enjoy uh, promoting this a little bit, trying to get around on Reddit, uh, amongst other places. So thank you if you came from there. Uh, we really enjoyed getting you guys to leave so many reviews. I can't believe we've hit uh, 5,000 reviews already. That's a joke because we're nowhere near that at the moment. But hey, maybe by the end of the season, that's true. By the time you listen to this, please <laughs> manufacture you didn't some this, consent there, right? Exactly. So created a narrative, <laughs> <laughs> a hyper reality. Um, <laughs> you guys, please do leave a review, leave a written review, share with somebody, uh, help more people find out about the show. Uh, we for now do need to roll. Uh, there's going to be a little break where we just play uh, replays of older mm-hmm. episodes, uh, and we'll be back very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Uh, we look forward to chatting, and we look forward to being back with season four. In the meantime, while we're on the break. Please send us episode ideas and feedback and join the WhatsApp. We'll join the WhatsApp group and we'll, we'll take all of it on board, ready for uh, a season where we'll be bigger and better and back stronger. Hello, I am Violet Manners, the daughter of the 11th Duke and Duchess of Rutland and executive producer of Duchess the Podcast. Have you ever watched fantastic series like Downton Abbey, Bridgerton or The Crown and caught yourself daydreaming about what it would be like to experience a life like that? If so, then you're in for a treat with Duchess, where we embark on an exploration of the most remarkable historic homes of Great Britain and Ireland, delve into the authentic life stories of their present day owners and uncover the incredible history behind these estates. Join us on the extraordinary journey through time hosted by the real Duchess of Rutland custodian of Beaver Castle and the Countess of Derby from Knowsley Hall discover Duchess the podcast on your favorite podcast platform today